Thank you, Sir Priya. Uh, good afternoon, Manan uh, Hall. Once again, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Biju Raghavan, sir. Uh, he's, a, he's a senior consultant and HOD of uh, pain and palliative medicine, uh, working at Rajagiri Hospital, Alva, uh, in Kerala. And I have been uh, practicing palliative care uh, since uh, 17 years, that is from uh, 2003. And he's also passed out uh, as a first uh, from the first batch of the uh, first year to, to a PG diploma in pain and palliative medicine program in the country. And uh, he's also working as a phys visiting faculty at uh, Tips Trivandrum and uh, MNJ Institute of Oncology and RCC Hyderabad uh, and uh, Department of Philosophy, Kerala University and Rajagiri College of uh, Social Science, Karnavalam. Uh, his area, areas of interest are, uh, interest are uh, communication skills, oncology and respiratory palliative care, and uh, end of life uh, care. It is a great uh, pleasure to have you, sir. Uh, and I welcome uh, Dr. Bijuraga and sir for taking the as a first part of the communication session. Welcome you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, James. Thank you, Raj Lakshmi, for inviting me. And uh, welcome to all the uh, delegates for today's session. Uh, today, we are going to do uh, a session on communication skills. It is in two parts. And today we will be doing part one, which is the basic general uh, issues in communication. So we will, uh, I'll, with your permission, I will uh, start the screen sharing. I hope uh, you can see the slide yes, properly sir. now. Perfect. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, that is where I work. That is Rajagiri Hospital, which is in uh, Cochin, which is in the central part of Kerala. For those who are joining from outside Kerala, today, uh, uh, communication skills part one. We are going to talk about the basic uh, communication skills today. So there have been a lot of studies in communication, a lot of research which has gone in. And uh, this uh, article came in uh, the Headache Journal in way back 1986. It's a very old article, but still very relevant. And what this article says that as far as patient satisfaction is concerned, in in as this headache uh, area is concerned, the best predictor for the resolution of headache problems turned out to be the patient's perception that they had an opportunity to tell their story uh, in the first visit itself. Basically, what that means is if the patient feels that they have been listened to and they are satisfied with their interaction with the healthcare professionals, then that itself takes care of a lot of their medical problems. And a lot of medical errors, if you find out why they happen, they found that around 60 to 70% happen due to poor communication and are completely preventable. And uh, here, I, you, most of you are physiotherapists, so it applies to you also, even though the heading is doctor-patient relationship. Effective communication has multi-dimensional uh, 
uh, what you call multi dimensional uh, benefits in the form of diagnostic accuracy if you are able to uh, communicate well you will be getting more information and more information means more power to come to the right diagnosis it also means the right kind of information just having lot of information doesn't help the right kind of information also gives you the power to arrive at the right kind of diagnosis good communication helps your patient understand why you are advising whatever you are advising and if they understand that then their compliance will be better and if your patient comply with your advice the outcome the clinical outcome that you were looking for will obviously be better and if the clinical outcomes are good you will have a happy and satisfied patient and family so if your patient is satisfied and happy your team will also be happy and satisfied because your team is also getting a positive feedback so you have a happy team because you have a happy patient along with it good communication skills ensure errors as a result of which the patient safety improves for example you have been advised to give provide some physiotherapy but if you are not being told that this patient had a hairline fracture somewhere and if you are also not aware of it there is poor communication there is a possibility that your intervention may make things worse so patient safety gets compromised and good communication skills ensure better patient safety and if your patients are safe and they are happy and satisfied the chances of you getting sued in our country people don't take you to court they beat you up on the spot so your chances of getting beaten up or assaulted comes down if you are going to work in a foreign country the chances of you getting taken to court also comes down and hence what is the basis basic aspect of communication you know that communication is key to any successful relationship interpersonal relationship or professional relationship professional relationship means between colleagues as well as with the patient and family and here we are talking about our relationship with patient and family and the key pillar of good communication is active listening we say communication is central to building up of a successful relationship with our patient and family and for good communication the most important ingredient is active listening so today whatever we are going to learn is going to contribute to our ability to listen actively because active listening is opposite to passive listening it is a very dynamic process so what all is involved in active listening there is a lot of body language as well as verbal do's and don'ts as far as body language is concerned why it is important that we need to learn body language it is because when we are interacting with our patient and family or in fact whenever we are interacting with anybody most of the time we are not aware of how our body is responding while we are talking to somebody most of the time we are not aware of what our body is saying sometimes it is in sync with what we are saying sometimes it is saying something opposite to what we are saying verbally so it is very important that we don't give confusing signals to the persons in front of you 
good body language will enhance active listening another reason why it is important to learn body language is because it constitutes the major component of any communication it constitutes the major component of any communication but we are not even aware of it how our hands are moving what is the expression of our face where is the gaze of your sight what is the tone of your voice how is your feet positioned are you slouching in the chair or are you sitting attentively a lot of these things has an impact on what you are communicating to the person in front of you are you appearing to be bored or arrogant or are you appearing to be sincere do you appear that you are helpful all of these things are conveyed not by your words but by your body language so it is a vast area we can't finish talking about body language ever it is like a vast ocean of knowledge if you are interested you can google for body language for medical professionals and you will get a lot of material but for today's session i am just focusing on a few of uh, the important easy to master something that you can start practicing from today onwards few issues around 6 7 points we are going to talk about first and foremost any any human interaction starts with eye contact now eye contact does not mean we stare into somebody's eyes because that will make the person very very uncomfortable so there is a momentary eye contact then you look into the face below the eye above the chin that area of the face so that the person always gets the feeling that you are attentive towards the other person if you stare into the eyes it may appear like a threatening gaze it's very uncomfortable so don't look down when you look away you be slow when you take your eyes off the person rather than focusing on the eyes look at another spot on the face as i just mentioned above and in between you can shake your head up and down or make some encouraging noises like mm mm-hmm, mm mm-hmm, like something like that so that the communication continues another important aspect of active listening is to smile now when you smile you are showing that you are harmless you are helpful and you are showing positive energy now you may think that when you are wearing a mask how can your smile be shown to the other person even if you are wearing a mask or even if you are wearing a full ppe suit your smile can be seen in your eyes if your eyes are also covered your smile can be heard in your voice so whether you wear a mask or a suit doesn't matter your smile the person will know that you have a smile just by looking into your eyes or just by hearing your voice a good thing is to practice professional smile i am not talking about spontaneous smile that comes to us when we see somebody we are familiar with when we see somebody we like a spontaneous smile comes but a professional smile is where you remember to smile at our patient and family consciously it doesn't come easy it comes only with practice and the important word here is practice you have to practice professional smile so where can you practice you can start practicing in your hospital consciously start smiling at the security person at the at your colleagues even though even if you don't know them 
the nurses, doctors, uh, social workers, the pharmacists. You can, uh, you you must uh, consciously remember to smile at the catering staff, at the administrative staff, whoever you can uh, think of. And once you consciously practice smiling, it will come as a spinal reflex. You don't have to think. Your brain doesn't have to think. Anybody passes in front of you, a smile will come to your face. It will be effortless. There's not going to be any effort. And this professional smile is going to help you in many, many tight situations. And with a good smile comes a natural good tone of voice. If you practice smiling, you will get a good voice, free, free, free. It's like buy one, get one free. You cannot have a bad tone of voice with a smile on your face. You can try. You can try to have a very, very harsh sounding voice with a smile on your face. It will be impossible. So if you practice this art of smiling, you will get a good tone of voice free. And remember, uh, many a times the argument starts not because of what you said, but because of how you said it. People may feel insulted by the tone of your voice, even if you said something very harmless. So it's very important to have a good tone of voice, a warm voice, a welcoming voice. Now coming to body position, this is a very important slide. If you look at this medical professional standing at the bedside of a patient, you can see that to make eye contact, this patient has to turn the head so that there can be a strain in the neck muscles here. So initial few seconds, it may be okay, but later on, it will become uncomfortable for the patient. Whereas if the medical professional were to stand somewhere nearer to the foot end, in the beginning part, hello, how are you doing today? That kind of initial, that is before the actual starting of our clinical examination or in your case, the physical a rehabilitation part, if you initial conversation, if you can have standing here, then this person will need not have to turn the head so much. The person can make eye contact more easily, comfortably. So when you enter a patient's room, you stand by the bedside nearer to the foot end. Of course, after the initial presentries, you can move towards the patient for further uh, procedures or uh, examination, etc., that you want to do. But starting point is ideally here. You can see another healthcare professional sitting nearer to the foot end of the patient. And eye contact is much more easy for the patient. The patient does not have to turn the head. Eye contact is easy because the medical professional is positioned nearer to the foot end. Now, compared to standing, when you sit down, it creates more satisfaction. Just imagine if some guests come into your house, they come into your drawing room, you give them tea and biscuits, they have the tea and all standing up, they never sit down. Will you be satisfied? Similarly, when you as a healthcare professional go into the patient's room, Starting point, at the foot end, sit down and say, how are you? What is the, how are you today? Is there any pain? Are you able to move your hand? Show me how you're doing it. Then you can stand up and then proceed to do physiotherapy. But if you are able to spend the initial one minute sitting down and talking, it will increase satisfaction. 
so i have talked about positioning yourself nearer to the foot end it becomes easy for eye contact and starting with sitting down instead of standing it will increase satisfaction when you are dealing with children you can see here this medical professional is positioned himself at the eye level of the child children are shorter in height and many a times we bend at the hip and in that process we look down on the child from a height from above that is not satisfactory as far as the child is concerned just like an adult a child also needs to be looked at eye level so you can bend at the knee or even more comfortable just pull up a chair or a stool and sit down so that you can be at the eye level of the child whether the child is standing or in a bed or sitting in a chair always position yourself at the eye level as much as possible this increases satisfaction instead of here the eye level is up to down this reduces satisfaction same level increases satisfaction so body position is very important in improving satisfaction the next part is body posture this position of bladosis shows a bit of arrogance it is not going to be satisfactory so when you are talking to the patient and your family at the starting point make sure your back is not touching the back the, the front part of your chair your back is not touching the backrest of your chair instead inside sit with a little bit of kyphosis a slight kyphosis shows gives the message i am here to listen to you right you are showing a very positive body language that i am here to listen to you and this is how the starting point should be when you are interacting with your patient or for that matter the family member if it is going to be a long discussion sometimes you will see that the patient or the family member may go back in that position in that case when you notice that they have gone back you can also go back so it is like having a conversation you start off with leaning forward little bit of kyphosis then go back if the patient the person sitting in front of you is also leaning back and after some time the person start leaning forward you also lean forward so it is called mirroring when you stand in front of the mirror if you go towards the mirror your image comes near to you if you go away from the mirror your image goes away so if the patient leans towards you you lean towards the patient if the patient leans away from you you lean away from the patient so it's called mirroring mirroring increases satisfaction another area of importance is respecting the body space we have our intimate space that is from our skin to about a foot or two foot in that place we allow only those people with whom we are intimate if any other person comes and stands very close to us we feel uncomfortable for example if we are traveling in a in a bus or in a lift which is very crowded we usually end up crossing our arms around our chest like this this is because we are trying to block others from coming very close to us it is a psychological thing we are uncomfortable when unknown people come very close to us so there is an intimate space then there is a social space it is from uh, from our intimate space to within a meter where we interact comfortably with all the people we know socially that is a lot of our colleagues in our workplace people we know 
many of our relatives that is we are not very intimate with them but at the same time we know them so a comfortable distance we naturally find rest of the other people strangers those people we don't know sometimes we give a little bit more distance if we feel threatened by them we try to create barriers between for example if you are at home and uh, somebody has come to knocking on the door or push the bell and uh, we don't know who this person is we are never seen we may not open the door at all we may talk to the person from the window what do you want what are you here for things like that so depending on uh, our comfort level with the person we may increase or decrease the distance between that person and us even in the public uh, spaces so why it is important to respect body space because when we are with the patient in medical profession we may be strangers to the patient they may be seeing us for the first time or we may be in at the socially acquainted but because of our profession we have to touch them and sometimes touch them very intimately as part of our profession and this can be a little uncomfortable so because we are not intimate with them in the as far as interpersonal relationship is concerned our relationship is purely professional but in the medical field we have to cross into the intimate area of the patient we have to touch them hold them and as a physiotherapist you have to manipulate them so we are intruding into the personal space a very very intimate space it can be uncomfortable see at the intellectual level they understand the patient understands but the discomfort comes at the emotional level right so it is very important to minimize the emotional discomfort it is very important to tell them what you are going to do before you actually touch them it will give them some uh you know some time even if it is one second you tell them i am going to hold your arm and pull it up and then you hold the arm so that just the act of holding the arm will now the person will be mentally prepared for it because you have told the person what you are going to do if you intrude into the body space of a person in an aggressive manner look at how this person is trying to lean back as much as possible in the chair so this is an aggressive intrusion and a negative reaction from the patient this is something that we must avoid because it creates lot of uh, you know and discomfort in the patient and even you even though you did not have any negative intentions your intentions were fine but this still makes a person uncomfortable whereas look at this picture this incidentally is my palliative care head nurse and this is on a home visit and look at this person all the things that we have talked about till now is there look at that eye contact and look at the eye contact at equal level not from high to low equal level there is a smile there is a smile and look at the body position both people are sitting so there is equal both body positions are equal and when you create equality in body position you create satisfaction so whenever you are going to meet patients start with being in the sitting position whether the patient is sitting or lying down if somebody is already in the standing position and if you are sitting and you can't offer a chair because there is no chair you also stand up 
that is also equalizing the body position so both are sitting and look at a body posture little bit of leaning forward look at the head little leaning forward little leaning forward right and comfortable distance comfortable to both of them you can see the physical uh, you know facial expression comfortable distance not very close not very far so this is kind of epitomizes what we are targeting all the positive things that we have talked about in one picture and of course as physiotherapists you will be touching patients as a doctor i will be touching patients but that is part of our physical examination or physical therapy apart from that never forget to touch them in a humane way in an emotional way when they are if they are sad a touch on the shoulder is very important and when you are done with the patient a handshake all of these things you know apart from the professional mandated touching uh, as a doctor i examine by stethoscope or i may you know percuss or palpate you as a physiotherapist may do a lot of uh, you know physical ma manipulations and all i am not talking about that i am talking about human to human interaction which involves a touch right so a simple handshake at the end of the session that is going to be very important in improving the satisfaction of the patient and the family now coming to some verbal do's and don'ts of course there are a lot of things but because of the time constraints i'm just picking on very very few aspects one is whenever you ask somebody don't ask in a leading question now you're better now is it you're better now you're uh, you're feeling better now your pain is all come down now so these kind of questions when you ask then they will be forced to say ah yes yes i am better now yes yes my pain is even if their pain is not good even if they are not better so never ask leading questions never ask question in a tone of leading question always ask in a open ended question how are you today so they will tell you whatever problem they have so your pain is better now isn't it you are better now isn't it instead of asking like that just ask how are you today so always ask open ended question never ask leading question another important part is do not minimize the patient's problem do not compare the patient's problem with somebody else for each person in this world their problem is the only problem in the world their problem is the biggest problem in the world so when you say oh don't worry it is such a small thing you are minimizing their problem and it will be totally unsatisfactory for the patient if i have a toothache and it is severe it is really troubling me i don't care if there are patients dying of cancer in severe pain i don't care what is important for me is my toothache so you telling me oh this is nothing and you comparing my problem with oh look going to the cancer ward there are patients suffering with pain your toothache is nothing you i am going to hate you for that you are not going to give me any satisfaction by saying things like that so do not minimize my problem do not compare my problem with some other problem you may have seen many things but for me my toothache is the only problem for me my toothache is the biggest problem so if your patient says something complains about a problem do not minimize do not compare instead of that what you should do you should acknowledge that okay there is a problem and normalize the patient's emotional experience 
I am not saying you normalize the problem. I am saying you normalize the patient's emotional experience. For example, considering what you have got, I'm not surprised that you're feeling this way. Anybody in your position will feel this way. So you are saying that you have the right. You are telling me that I have the right to be anxious. I have the right to be angry. I have the right to be frustrated because of my toothache. You are normalizing. You're saying it is normal for me to experience this way. You are, it is normal for me to be angry that I have a toothache. So whenever you have your patients who are suffering and, uh, you know, they are in distress, always acknowledge their suffering and normalize their emotional experience. Never give false hopes. Remember, as physiotherapists, you may be dealing with, let's say, a patient with traumatic brain injury and their parents are spending money like water and saying, oh, he will get better, he will get better. And maybe the neurosurgeon has uh, now done his or her part and said, okay, now you go to the physiotherapist. It is their area now. Now it is up to them. And now they have put all your all the faith in you and they they want you to say i will make your uh, child uh, walk again but you know that is not possible but in that kind of situation you say oh no problem we will do something we will do something don't worry all of these are going to be false hopes it will come to bite you in the future because eventually the, they run out of money, eventually they run out of patience, eventually they run out of the goodwill that they had for you. And then they start biting you. So never give false hopes. Always bring the expectation to reality. Constantly counseling them about what is possible, what is not possible. And while doing that, you give them realistic hope. Realistic hope means something that you can realistically achieve. That you have to give as hope, not false hope. Because if you give false hope, you are torturing the patient, the family, and in the end, they will torture you. Very important, never give false hope. Always give realistic hope. And to give realistic hope, you have to bring their expectation to reality. Never assume why people say what they say. They may be saying something. Or, for example, if your uh, patient is saying, you know, I am done with my life. Uh, my life is gone and you say no 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 we are here to help you out you are here and everything will be there we are supporting you uh, and if you don't know why the person said that for example what if the person saying my my life is gone what if the person is worried that how am i going to get my daughter married off i am now paraplegic i am not able to work how am i going to get my daughter married off and you are saying, don't worry, we are here, there for you. We will support you in anything. Are you going to get the daughter married off? Can you do that? So when it's very important when somebody says, I'm so worried, I'm so angry, I'm so scared. When people say something, you ask them, why did you say that? And they will tell you. It is as simple as that. Do not assume. Don't think why they are saying something or behaving in a certain way. The simple thing is ask, ask, ask. It's as simple as that. But somehow we are never taught to ask and we end up assuming. A quick history taking, I know that as physiotherapists, you are used to taking history of the problems, but this is a general thing. So first greeting, 
that involves making eye contact, smile, nod your head, and say what is culturally appropriate, good morning, namaste, namaskaram, whatever. And then get yourself comfortable. That means pull up a chair if you have gone to visit the patient or if they have come to visit you, offer them a seat to sit down. Basically, you and others get comfortable. First priority is to get comfortable. And then you start the interview by asking an open-ended question. So how can I help you? What brings you here? Tell me. Or anything. You, it's up to you. And once you have started the interview with an open-ended question, then you have to listen. Do not interrupt. There have been a lot of studies which shows among doctors that they interrupt within the first 15 to 18 seconds. Seconds. I'm not talking minutes. I'm talking seconds. That is how impatient we medical professionals are. And not only we have to remind ourselves not to interrupt, we have to remind ourselves to encourage the patient to talk by maintaining eye contact, nodding your head, mm -hmm, and making sounds like, mm -hmm, okay, then what happened? Okay, go on. So these kind of words and sounds are going to encourage the patient or the family member to talk. While they're telling you things, it's possible that you may not understand something. Don't wait for it. Don't wait to clarify later on. Clarify as you go along. Because sometimes later, it may be an important thing, but sometimes later you may forget about it. So clarify as you go along. What did you say? Can you repeat that? So in this way, you can clarify. Then very important part is ask them, what do they understand? Okay, they had a road traffic accident. They had a paraplegia. Neurosurgeon did uh, some whatever was possible. Now the patient is under your care. Ask them, what do you, what do you think is happening to you? What have your doctors told you? Did they tell you what kind of injuries you have? Did they tell you what is possible and what is not possible? So you have to try to understand what they understand. Along with it, you also need to understand what their concerns are. What is their priorities? A paraplegic patient says, so oh, I need to get back on my life because uh, I used to be a coconut tree climber and uh, I have to get back onto my life. That is their priority. That is their concern. So within you, you will get to know what is it that they're aiming for. And then within you, with your expertise, with your knowledge, you know whether that is unrealistic or realistic whether it is possible or not. So it's very important to understand what the patient understands as well as what is their concerns and what are their priorities. And then it is important, the difficult part is to share information honestly. And here we are getting into the area of communicating bad news because many a times in medical professions, we don't have good news to share. We often have bad news to share and when we share the bad news or we are sharing information honestly use simple language and cut out the medical jargon because people don't understand they may be highly educated they may be chartered accountant they may be lawyers they may be engineers but they just don't understand the medical jargon just like as a doctor i will not understand the engineer's jargon or I may not understand the legal jargon. I may not understand the chartered accountant's uh, jargon. I may not understand the economics, economist jargon on economy. I may not understand the philosopher's jargon on philosophy because jargon is essentially a, a communication tool for inter, intra-professional communication. That is from within the same, for example, within medical professionals, we can use jargon because you can exchange a lot of information in short uh, volume, in short quantity. But we cannot use that with other people. 
because it is not going to make any sense to them. Discuss treatment options, but don't become a waiter in a hotel. Uh, you have this option, that option, that option, you choose. No. As healthcare professionals, it is our responsibility to be a friend and a guide to the patient. Try to think from their point of view what is practical. Offer solutions in that way. Recommend something. If in my if I were in that position, I would recommend this. So don't just say, okay, you have this option, you have, you know. I, I, I can give you uh, what you call tens. I can give you uh, infrared therapy. I can give you a trigger massage or whatever. No, tell them in this situation, I think this will be a better option, uh, but it's going to cost uh, this much and it's going to be for this many days. So it's important that you have give them proper in, in information. And remember, people are different. They have different kinds of beliefs. They have fears. They have logistical problems. They may be somebody who doesn't have enough money or they may be somebody who doesn't have a relative or a bystander to come with them. So there can be all kinds of problems and constraints. So you have to understand that people, you may be an expert on your subject, but the patient is an expert on the patient's life and the patient's situation. You cannot be an expert on them. So we have to listen to their part. What are their issues? What are their problems? What are their constraints? And then come to a decision by participation. You as a physiotherapist may be suggesting, let us do so, you know, let us do this, 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 these things. For that, you have to come every week, but the patient lives very far away, can't afford to come or physically cannot come, then you have to think what else can I do for them? What is basically what is practically possible? Not the best decision, but the most practical decision is what is going to get you clinical outcomes. And in the end, you can summarize the interview. This is what we have discussed. Give them uh, clarity of when the person is supposed to come. Uh, unfortunately, I see many patients uh, who during home care who have been discharged, but they have no idea when they are supposed to uh, re revisit. They say nobody told us. It's very, it's very important that you tell them, okay, we are doing so and so and you come to visit me next Monday, so-and-so date, at so-and-so time. Give them clarity. And before you close any interview or if you're, you have finished your physiotherapy and before you, uh, you are shaking hands, while shaking hands, you can ask, is there anything else that you want to say? Is there anything else that you want to ask? This usually brings a smile on their face. And that is a good way of stopping our interview. Leave when the patient is smiling. And to bring a smile on the patient's face, always ask, is there anything else? It gives satisfaction. After all the talking, after all the therapy, everything, last point, handshaking, is there anything else that you want to ask? Is there anything else you want to say? And this brings a smile. And with that, you can finish the interview or finish your interaction with the patient. In case the patient wants to contact you, give them a number. If you don't want to give your personal mobile number, that is fine, no problem. But give them some number. You can give them the department number, hospital number, some way where they can contact you in case you need to. In the end, greeting, just like in the beginning, make eye contact, you smile, and you say what is culturally appropriate. Namaste, namaskaram, apashari. Right? So you finish like that. So finishing the last uh, one or two slides. Empathy. Empathy is basically you are not sorry for somebody. You are trying to feel 
what the other person feels trying to put yourself in the other person's life and trying to feel what if i were in that position or if what if my mother was in that position or what if my father was in the, what if my brother what if my sister what if my wife what if my children what if my child were in that position how would i feel and then deal with your patient and family make it personal there's no harm in trying to see each of your patient as somebody of your own it improves your quality of care it improves their satisfaction of you interacting with them remember doesn't matter how many degrees you have or how big hospital you are working in patients remember how they were made to feel you may have told them a lot of things you may have done a lot of things but it matters about how you made them feel basically it's about the heart it's about emotion people remember that people remember how they were made to feel and all these active listening skills that we talked about today all the body language all the verbal do's and don'ts is focused on improving their experience of interaction with us the emotional experience where we gave them satisfaction where we made them feel that they were listened to so practice body language remember the verbal do's and don'ts with that i am uh, concluding my talk i will be happy to take any questions right now or after the case discussion i will leave it to james and uh, rajlakshmi on that i will stop uh, sharing the screen thank you for your patient listening and over to you uh, james and rajlakshmi thank you uh, thank you sir thank you very much uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation and uh, now we can uh, take up to a few questions uh, before we move, move to case presentation uh, you can uh, type type questions on your chat box either or either you can uh, type on the chat box or you can um, unmute and ask If you have any queries, uh, inputs, or questions, you can come up, or else uh, I think we can uh, move to case presentation. Yeah, if there are no questions, we can proceed. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Okay. Thank you, sir. So today we have uh, Cameron Nahar, uh, who is who will be taking a, giving a case presentation today, and uh, over to uh, Cameron Nahar. Hello everyone. I am Kamru Nahar from Bangladesh. By profession, I am a physiotherapist working in a community-based palliative care project, which is Compassionate Coral. And uh, this is an urban slum project. And uh, it is, uh, as you know, it's different from any other project. And this is my presentation. My patient's details is there. Uh, he is a 59 years old male patient and diagnosed with severe with left sided hemiplegia. And the, the, uh, these are the complaints and the memory loss, back pain, weakness in the left side of the body, difficulty in walking, difficulty understanding humor, and difficulty talking turns in a conversation, and anxiety, depression, sadness, suicidal thoughts uh, being a burden. And this is the history of his illness. In 2012, early in the morning, patient felt weakness uh, on his left side uh, while he was going to the bathroom and fall down suddenly. 
after that uh, he took primary care from a pharmacy shop and uh, then went to a nearby hospital and started treatment for one month but he didn't get any physiotherapy treatment or only the medical treatment was there and then went to the village and uh, he took the uh, ayurvedic treatment and that some quark treatment as uh, he is no he's the only member of the family uh, who income so there is very much debate uh, so they cannot afford the uh, hospital bill so uh, he went to the village and in 2019 he returned to coral slum uh, where our project compassionate coral has worked and uh, he has listed by us and taking the services and this is the case description and uh, that uh, the uh, present uh, medical history was uh, high blood pressure was there, no asthma or, or diabetes mellitus and heart disease, but drug history, tab uh, tablet bizarro and nidocard, deton, etc. And uh, there is not any uh, CT scan or MRI that uh, they can provide us. And the family history, there were five members in his family. He is the only income source. And the personal habit was smoking and better live. And uh, their house type was tin shed building. And uh, stair was two steps. And toilet was Asian toilet. And excess road type was pitch. And uh, this is the objective uh, assessment. General observation, uh, patient has slouch posture with wheelchair and, and he was conscious and drew, uh, there is no drooling or edema. And the local observation, we uh, saw that uh, he has BP 130 by 70 and the pulse was 70 uh, beats per minute and temperature was normal. And the gross motor function, uh, uh, his ruling was independent, but breathing with minimum support uh, in the affected leg and lying to sitting with moderate support and sitting to standing with moderate support and sitting posture, slouch posture with a minimum support and standing moderate support with two persons. And the upper and lower limb muscle tone, uh, range of motion and strength. Uh, uh, I uh, input the affected side only. Muscle tone was increased as he came to us about nearby six to seven years later. And the range of motion was lost and uh, there was a pain and strained Oxford muscle grade. Uh, he has muscle grade three and four above the upper limb and the lower limb. And then we plan a physiotherapy, a medical treatment, uh, other. And uh, I have to the physiotherapy intervene, uh, give them uh, the physiotherapy intervention, which was first uh, we give uh, patient education on activity mod modification, basic functional activities, and range of motion exercise stretches, and uh, that are passive and active range of motion, active assistive range of motion, and uh, bed mobility practice, which is very much important for him rolling breathing and lying to sitting and then stretching exercise affected limb and spinal muscles and strengthening and muscle setting program then and uh, the balance and coordination training also input there and uh, gait re-education is very much important for him and the progressive resistance training beside that chest mobility exercise breathing exercise and counseling was there Uh, but uh, we are having difficulty communicate with uh, him. So changes were brought to examine and the treatment. Uh, psychosocial aspect, uh, poor socioeconomic condition and debit around three lakhs from the relatives and neighbors during the treatment. Elder sons don't give any expense uh, of him. His wife works as a servant and a younger son who is only 15 years old uh, earned daily wages and no one talks to him because uh, of his arrogant behavior. And patient says that I am worried about my future. No one care about me. And this is the main concern of him. The physical concern was memory loss, back pain, weakness in the left side, 
of the body, difficulty in walking, and psychological, that anxiety and depression, sadness, suicidal thoughts, being a burden of the family, and the socio-economic debit around three lakhs from the relatives and neighbors during the treatment, which is very much uh, affected by uh, affected him and the elder sons who don't give any expense uh, in every uh, visit he uh, try to talk about this his son didn't uh, give uh, him any expense or anything and spiritually uh, he's always said that why this happened to me And this is the summary, 59 years old male patient with severe with left-sided hemiplegia with the physical, mental, social, and spiritual issues. And this is the discussion point. Uh, what can be done for providing total care of this patient and how to improve the quality of this patient as a palliative care team and uh, how to improve the communication with, the, with him and uh, what are the other mental and vocational rehabilitation that can be done for these patients. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Cameron Annala, for the wonderful presentation. Um, now, I uh, turn to the participants for, for this discussion point. You can see on your uh, screen now. Uh, these are the questions that a uh, uh, case presenter put, uh, put on. You can discuss on that points, and you can uh, give input on these points. As uh, this is a session on communication, we can uh, focus more on the uh, third question, that is how to improve the communication with him. Uh, can any, anybody come with uh, come up with the, some inputs? Uh, before moving on, I would like to uh, ask Ms. Kamrun Nagar, what are the uh, challenges or barriers you face uh, when you try to communicate with this, this patient? Uh, first time, uh, he was alone in his room as uh, uh, his wife and the sons work in the other side of the house. And uh, most of the time he was alone in his room, uh, in a very small room in the slum. And when we talk to him, uh, uh, at first uh, he doesn't involve in our conversation or others. Uh, then uh, we try to console him different type of talk and, uh, uh, but uh, he didn't uh, answer any question at first, but sometimes later, sometimes our palliative care assistant and uh, our team, uh, but uh, most of the time our palliative care assistant visit him and uh, try to console him and talk to him about the, uh, but uh, at first we try to talk about uh, his family and the health, but uh, don't give him any suggestion or anything, but uh, he is uh, supposed to, uh, he always try to sleep. When we go there, uh, we saw that he's sleeping or he's lying. Uh, he's not comfortable in sitting or uh, any other. Uh, no other relatives or neighbors came to him to talk. So he's very uh, alone in uh, his room. So he's not uh, able to talk to us about the his health and mental problem or psychosocial problem. Then we talk after some times when we talk, then we... Uh, this uh, uh, point this problem which i put it on the physical psychosocial and the mental problem as uh, he don't have any uh, speech problem but uh, he is not interested at all to talk with us
so as uh, ms cameron has said uh we have heard the challenges and uh, difficulties to communicate with these uh, these type of patients so how we can uh, start communicating with uh, this type of patients uh, i would like to hear from participants can i talk now can i talk now can i ask something yes, yes, carry on please uh, actually from the case presentation uh, i have a doubt because um, she mentioned about uh, difficulty to understand humor uh, it means really the patient has something some understanding problem is there maybe because of this uh, he cannot understand well or uh, that's what my doubt actually maybe because of this he is not listening or me he is not able to understand the health the provider the healthcare providers maybe this is the issue Uh, can can you answer for that uh, ms cameron now actually yeah, what we have uh, uh, he don't want to listen us uh, he is always the bare face and uh, he is always seeing the uh, wall or sky and uh, he is not uh, very much interested to talk about any other topic uh, which is regarding to his uh, life or also uh, every uh, when we uh, go there uh, he only said that what it it's me it's me uh, why allah does this uh, with me and uh, it's uh, his talk Mm. yeah that's what i that's 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 my doubt actually he has whether he has any communication issue is there because you mentioned in the case presentation he cannot understand the humor i suppose see what when we are communicating actually uh, we are uh, as the sir discussed now before we have to smile we have to our body language voice really we are we are using these things means if really patient can't understand these things means it will be a major barrier for us now to communicate maybe this is the thing actually uh, what we discussed here how to improve the communication maybe the input it's there is a barrier to get the input means maybe it's a reason for him but actually how to overcome these things means only with the visual sense or by our smiling face as the sir discussed here now no, that's my that's what my suggestion actually <laughs> because the patient is suffering so many things so many so many issues here uh, so that's what i understand from this in your case presentation thank you uh, thank you mr abdullah uh, sir may i Yes, go ahead, Priyanka. Uh, sir, this is Vandana. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, um, as uh, from the uh, case study, it is uh, clear that the patient is um, arrogant or uh, he is having that behavior. It's very clear. It's because of the uh, chronic illness. or the disability which uh, the patient is having and also the financial burden which uh, he and uh, his family was uh, uh, having and uh, thirdly the social isolation because uh, uh, he is continuously telling like um, uh, my son is not looking after me and he is not giving me uh, that financial support for my treatment like that so there is a social isolation also so the financial burden the social isolation as well as the chronic illness the effect of chronic illness all these three uh, are the uh, communicating factors which is actually affecting the psychology of the patient and uh, as a result of which the patient behavior has changed to the arrogant behavior so in this case uh, if we want to communicate uh, with this uh, uh, with this type of patient or this patient then we have to be very compassionate a voice has to be very compassionate also to communicate with uh, him it is uh, always a, a good practice uh, to take help from uh, the caretaker or like the from his wife or uh, that care caretaker which uh, is more closer to the uh, patient 
and uh, with whom he feels much more uh, comfortable and he can share his uh, um, uh, like um, whatever he is feeling or his views with him comfortably so that uh, from like uh, not directly we are not able to communicate uh, with him directly so through a channel we can have like what all things are going on in his mind and how can we uh, as a physiotherapist or as the rehab professional we can help that patient to overcome that particular thing and uh, yes we should be very compassionate and uh, should be like a uh, very uh, soft spoken while uh, dealing with these type of patients so this is from my side sir thank you thank you vandana uh, patel as uh, ms vandana dabla said uh, actually this patient will be having uh, the uh, problem because of his disease as well as his uh, psychosocial uh, problems uh, he will be have because of this uh, cva he will be having cognition uh, he might have loss his cognition skills and everything and addition to that he will be uh, he is having a lot of uh, psychosocial issues and all now altogether he it will be uh, difficult to uh, manage or uh, start with the communication as uh, dr vandana patel said we can uh, we can uh, arrange someone who is very close to the patient like his primary caregiver or his uh, spouse or family members and we can uh, start uh, speaking with them and uh, through that we can uh, improve our communication skill with that a patient uh, priyanshu also have a raised hand uh, if you want to speak up something uh, i request priyanshu to come up hello good afternoon uh, i just wanted to agree with what dr vandana told that uh, instead of us being the first part uh, to communicate with the patient we should always uh, think it is this way that whoever is close to the patient maybe patient will open up to that person firstly then next thing what i would like to add upon is uh, as as you mentioned that patient kept on complaining that after him uh, what will happen to the wife and uh, the son right and as mentioned that the son was also a daily wage worker so as a physiotherapist there is not much what we can do but there are other departments who can deal with this right so if we try to solve that first i think the patient will be more comfortable talking to us so that i would just like to add upon and uh, maybe once we give him i'm not saying a hope but maybe we, once we give him a, a option that okay this can be done or whatever there are options like that so he will open up to us if we give him the option that there are social workers who can look after the studies for the uh, son or the wife or they can provide some uh, opp job opportunities to the wife so maybe the patient will open to uh, open up to us okay thank you okay uh, thank you priyanshu was uh, priyanshu said it is important to work as a, a team as a, a rehab team to uh, get treated this type of patients and he needs uh, a support of a, of a counselor or a doctor a physiotherapist or occupational therapist and uh, we have to work as a, uh, along with the team to get uh, better out of this type of patients and uh, mr haribau uh, haribau uh, sent a message on chat box and uh, he, he think he need uh, this patient needs a economic support and he is suffering more because of poverty and of course as i mentioned uh, he, he needs a uh, he need to get treated as a whole team Uh, as a rehab team um and anyway, if you have any, any more inputs you can uh, tell or else we can uh, move to dr uh, biju raghavan sir for his uh, comments and inputs for this patient uh, this presentation over to you sir so you are muted yes ah uh, thank you james ah uh, first of all kamarun khub bhalo excellent presentation it thank was very you, very <laughs> very very comprehensive and uh, i'm very impressed because you know you have covered everything so thank you for that and also uh, you know our participant 
Mr. Abhilash, Dr. Vandana, Priyanshu, Hari Babu, all of you have given such excellent input. You know, I don't think I need to give anything more from my side. You have just covered anything and everything that I could have told you. So I'm very happy to see this excellent interaction. You have made it very clear, uh, Cameroon, that this person did not have any speech disability. So we have ruled out the physical barriers to communication. We obviously understand that there are a lot of emotional issues. Uh, he seems to be depressed. He does not want to talk. He has uh, socio-economic concerns, uh, stresses as well. He has uh, uh, existential pain, spiritual pain. You know, why me? All of this contributes, as Dr. Vandana mentioned, to this person doesn't want him to talk. He just doesn't want anything to do with any of us. Leave me alone. You know, that kind of a situation. So I agree with all of you on every aspect that you have suggested. Only thing that I may want to add, which none of you mentioned, is that one word, which as physiotherapists, you have plenty of inside you. Patience. We have to be patient. As physiotherapists, as far as rehab is concerned, you work with the patient for weeks, months, sometimes even more. So among the healthcare professional, if we can say which is the most patient healthcare professional, it has to be people dealing with physical medicine and rehabilitation. So in communication also, when people are non communicating, not interested in communicating because they're suffering. It is not that they will not communicate. They're suffering so much that they don't trust you. We have to earn the trust. So how to earn the trust? All the things that we discussed today, as Abhilash was saying about all the topics that were, we covered today, and just be patient, showing them that we are here with you. We are not going away. That patience may take two days, it may take three days, but when they realize that we are not here to do something and go away, we are here for you, then they will open up and perhaps they'll be grateful that you stayed around. Um, they they stuck with you, you know. So that is the only thing I can think of adding. Rest everything you have covered. I'm so happy that we have such an excellent crowd here today. My pleasure, my privilege to have had this opportunity to interact with you. Thank you for all the input and. Uh, I think James is going to tell you, or Rajlakshmi is going to tell you that we are going to meet again with part two on March 8th. Correct me if I'm wrong, James, Rajlakshmi? Yes, yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay. So even though we are kind of coming to the end of today's session, we will meet yet again, March 8th. So that's from my side. Thank you, all of you. Great being here with you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for, for your wonderful inputs. Uh, so I think we can uh, wind up a uh, case presentation with that. And uh, it's, uh, it's all over to you, Sri Priya. Thank you, Dr. Biju Raghavan. Thank you for uh, sparing your valuable time. We do understand what a busy schedule you are having. And thank you for sharing your, your time for our participants. Uh, as usual, this was a mind-blowing session because uh, personally, I have been sitting through a lot of sessions with you, but each session is uh, enriching every time. So I believe all the participants would agree to that completely. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sridevi, for joining us as well. Uh, Dr. Sridevi, would you like to add any closing remarks before we 
No, no. I think I already typed in the chat the excellent discussion because everyone had their points and it's like they made their points very clearly, very descriptive, not for the sake of discussion. So I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion part actually uh, because everyone was asking questions and she was uh, cl clarifying what she has done and taking input. So it's a wonderful, wonderful discussion. And uh, uh, thank you, James, for coordinating it really well and summarizing wherever it is it was needed. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that. Uh, so, uh, with that note, this is Sri Priya along with Dr. Biju Rakavan, Mr. James, and Dr. Sri Devi signing off from the Tips Echo Hub. Please do remember to give your feedback because it is very valuable for us. The link will be shared in the WhatsApp group very shortly. Please do leave your feedbacks. And as uh, Dr. Biju Rakavan said, the next session is also on communication with uh, more focus on pollution and handling battles, which will be taken by Dr. Biju Rakavan himself. So till then, take care, be happy, be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am.